Hello everybody, this is Shujoy Das and my presentation today is on the life of a legendary climber, Tenzing Norge Sherpa, Tiger of the Snows. And it is only fitting that this presentation should be made on 29th May 2020, 67 years after the first ascent of Everest. This presentation is a part of the IMF webinar series which is a very good initiative, and I'm very happy to be associated with it. A brief introduction about myself. I have been trekking and photographing in the Himalayas for more than 30 years now. I founded a company called South Call Expeditions, which runs treks and photo workshops in the Himalayas. I'm the co-author and photographer of a number of books on the Himalaya, like Everest, Nepal, Himalaya, Sikkim, and I have a special interest in the history of Everest and the Sherpa community. The copyright notice, all the photographs, maps and diagrams used in this presentation are for non-commercial use only and are copyright of their respective owners. So let us start our story, which begins many years ago on 8th June, 1924. And on this day, two climbers left this high camp, Camp 6, around 8 o'clock in the morning as a part of the 1924 British Everest expedition to make a bid for the summit of Everest. And on the same day, another British climber by the name of Noel Odell was climbing up to Camp 6, collecting fossils on the way. Odell recalls that it was not the perfect day to climb Everest. Rolling banks of mist were sweeping across the North Face and there was a stiff breeze blowing as well. Suddenly, around 12.50 in the afternoon, from somewhere here, Odell spotted the mist clearing and he saw a black dot climbing a rock step, which he thought at that time was the second step. And as Odell gazed, he spotted another black dot following the first black dot. But before Odell could be sure that the second black dot had in fact joined the first black dot on the top of the step, the mist rolled in again and this fantastic vision was lost forever. As most of us know, the two climbers who Odell saw were George Mallory and Andrew Irvin going strongly for the summit of Everest. Mallory and Irvin were never seen again. And around the time that Mallory and Irvin vanished high on the slopes of Mount Everest, a Tibetan boy who could very well be this one was grazing his father's yaks in the Kartha Valley in the shadow of Mount Everest. That Tibetan boy was Tenzing Norge. So Tenzing was born in the spring of 1914 in a Beul. A Beul is a sacred valley with great spiritual properties. And this lake called Sechu was located inside that Beul near a monastery called Ghangla in the Kartha region of Tibet. And Tenzing was born in a yak herder's tent next to the lake of Sechu. He was the 11th child of his father Mingma and his mother Kinzong. But eight of his siblings had died either in childbirth or in infancy. So his two elder brothers were alive when he was born. Tenzing's parents named him Namgya Luangbi. After a few years, he was taken to meet a famous Rinpoche called Dratsul Rinpoche, who was the founder of Rongbuk Monastery. Dratsul told his parents that Tenzing was the reincarnate of a very wealthy man, and he wanted to change his name from Namgyal Wangbi. So Dratsul called him Tenzing Noge. Tenzing was the Rinpoche's own name, and it meant supporter of religion 
and Norge meant wealthy. Being the third son, Tenzing was sent to the monastery to become a Lama. But monastic life did not agree with Tenzing. And after a few months, he ran away from the monastery and returned to his parents to become a yak herder in the Kartha Valley. So this map gives us an idea of the region where Tenzing was born. Here you have the site of Tenzing's birth. You can see the Lake Sechu and Ghangla on top. Up here in the north is the monastery of Rongbok. Mount Everest is on the border of Nepal and China, as shown here. Far here to the west is the pass of Nangpala, the snowy pass to the Kumbu. And down here is Thami in the Solo Kumbu, where Tenzing came to live for a few years. So when Tenzing was grazing yaks in the Kartha Valley, there were views of Everest, which he saw almost every day. This famous photograph taken by a British photographer, E.F. Wollaston in 1921, shows the sweep of the Kangshung face of Everest from a camp in the Kartha Valley. And this photograph taken by Captain John Noel of the British expedition of 1921, shows the Rongbuk Monastery at the base of Mount Everest. If you go to Rongbuk today, you would not see this monastery as it has been rebuilt and there is a new monastery at Rongbuk. Naturally, not as evocative as this one. So there are no photographs of Tenzing as a young boy in Tibet. So I've used some of my own photographs to try to explain what Tenzing's life must have been as a yak herder. In this photograph, you can see this young boy taking the sheep out to graze in the morning in the Lonak Valley in North Sikkim. Tenzing must have done the same thing, taken his yak out to pasture every morning. A yak wool tent like this one would have been Tenzing's home and the yak nomads would have been moving from pasture to pasture for their cattle. Tenzing's mother would have made yak milk and yak butter in a tent like this one. Sometime in the late 1920s, Tenzing recalls that there was a major epidemic in the Kartha Valley and most of the yaks died in this epidemic. Tenzing's father, Mingma, lost all his yaks. He was devastated. He had nothing left and he had no work for Tenzing and he didn't know how to look after his family. So Mingma decided to send Tenzing to work in the Kumbu in a wealthy Sherpa home in Thami. So this map shows again the long road from the Kartha Valley here all the way down to Thami in the Kumbu here across the Nangpala. And this is a photograph of a yak caravan crossing the 18,753 high glaciated Nangpala. And Tenzing must have been a part of a caravan like this when he came to work in the Kumbu. So this is a modern day picture of the village of Thami in the Kumbu. And this was the village where Tenzing came to work and live for a few years. But Tenzing was not happy with his life in the Kumbu. He did not want to remain working for a Sherpa family. He had set his heart on being an expedition Sherpa. And he knew that if he had to become an expedition Sherpa, he had to go to Darjeeling because Darjeeling was the hub for all expeditions in the 1920s and 1930s. All the Sherpas were recruited in Darjeeling. There was also another complication. Tenzing had fallen in love with the girl of the house, Dawa Futi. And Dawa Futi's parents were dead against the match. They did not want a wealthy Sherpani to marry a landless Tibetan yak herder. So Tenzing and Dawa Futi decided to flee to Darjeeling. This would help them to escape Dawa Futi's parents and also give Tenzing a chance to 
to pursue his dream to become an expedition Sherpa. So another friend of Tenzing by the name of Dawa Thonduk accompanied them. And this was a, the beginning of a long friendship between Tenzing and Dawa Thonduk, which culminated in the 1953 expedition when Dawa Thonduk carried loads for the British to the South Col, and he made two carries to the South Col camp. So Tenzing came to Darjeeling in 1932, and he managed to get a job in an area called Alubari to look after cows. Tenzing was a yak herdsman, so it would not have been difficult for him to look after cows. And this map again shows the long road which Tenzing would have taken from the Kumbu, passing through the lower reaches of Nepal and then crossing the border into Darjeeling. So Darjeeling in the 1930s was a far cry from the Darjeeling of today. This photograph from the Das Studio collection shows neatly manicured lawns, beautiful small bungalows, roads with hardly any cars. There's just one car parked on this road, as you can see, and uh, a clean and neat town. And of course, this wonderful view of Kanchinjunga above the town. In 1933, Denzing appeared on the veranda of the Planters Club Darjeeling and applied to, as a, for a job as a Sherpa for the 1933 Everest expedition led by Hugh Rutledge. As Tenzing had no experience, he was rejected outright. Interestingly, his friend Dawa Thonduk, who was seven years older than him and who had no experience as well, was selected for the 1933 expedition. A dismal Tenzing went back to Alubari and continued to look after his cows and sell milk in the Darjeeling Bazaar. In 1934, a huge earthquake struck India and East Nepal, and more than 10,000 people died. Tenzing somehow got the news that his parents believed that he had perished in the earthquake, and they were getting ready to perform his funeral rites. Tenzing immediately rushed to Tibet to meet his parents and convince them that he was still alive. He also helped to rebuild his parents' home in Tibet, which was damaged. A year later, in 1935, Tenzing returned to Darjeeling. He had some money then, and he rented a room in Bhutia Basti, a locality of Darjeeling, and he then married Daba Futi. In 1935, the British returned to Darjeeling to recruit Sherpas and porters for the Everest expedition led by Eric Shipton. Tenzing once again appeared on the veranda of the Planters Club, but like 1933, he was asked to stand aside. But Eric Shipton, the leader of the 1933 expedition, noticed Tenzing standing near the railings and called him up. As Shipton says, from 100 applicants, we chose 15 Sherpas, and Tenzing Norgay was chosen largely because of his attractive grin. So it was Eric Shipton who gave Tenzing his first chance to go to Everest, and Tenzing remained beholden to Shipton for this. So the Everest expeditions which Tenzing was associated with, 1935, 1936 and 1938. 1935 was his first expedition and Tenzing had never climbed a mountain before. As Tenzing says, I did not know how to climb. I watched the British climbers, copied their moves, and that is how I learned how to climb. But even then, on his first expedition, Tenzing did very well. He climbed an unnamed peak with Bryant and Warren 22,740 feet, and then he reached the North Col as well. No mean achievement for a novice climber. In 1938, he did even better, reaching Camp 6 at 27,200 feet. And for this, he was given the Tiger Badge from the British under Bill Tillman. In 1939, 
Tenzing got an opportunity to climb a mountain in the Hindu Kush near the town of Chitral called Tirichmir. And he attempted this climb with two English clients, a couple, Beryl and Miles Smeaton. The team reached a ridge around 23,000 feet, but were unable to proceed higher. Tenzing was disappointed, but they came back. When Tenzing descended from Tirich Mill, he did not have a job, but he met a major white of the Chitral scouts who offered him a job to work with him. And Tenzing spent the next five years with Major White. In the end of 1939, he suddenly got the very sad news that his son Nima, four years old, had died of dysentery in Darjeeling. Tenzing immediately rushed back to Darjeeling and took his wife Dawa Futi and his two daughters, Pempem and Nima, back with him to Chitra. But tragically, Dawa Futi did not keep very well in the Chitral, and in the autumn of 1944, she passed away and she was buried in the Chitral. Early in 1945, Tenzing decided that he had spent a long time in the Hindu Kush and he wanted to go home. So taking his two daughters, he decided to go back to Darjeeling. But getting a ticket on a train was not very easy at that time. It was the war years and most of the seats were reserved for the British. Tenzing waited in the station for a few days, but no seats were available. Finally, Tenzing lost patience and he decided to wear the uniform of the Chitral Scouts, which Major White had given him. Wearing this uniform and taking his two daughters, one in each hand, he marched confidently into a first class compartment and closed the door. No one questioned Tenzing, and he traveled all the way to Siliguri in this way. So Tenzing returned to Darjeeling in early 1945 and came to Tung Song Basti. This was in fact the most difficult period of Tenzing's life. He had lost his wife, he had lost his son. He had very little money given to him by Major White. He had no job and the possibility of getting a job was also very difficult. There was no likelihood of any mountaineering expeditions in the near future. He had two young daughters to look after. How was he going to manage his life? Tenzing had hit rock bottom. One day in the Darjeeling Bazaar, he met a Sherpani, Anglamu, who he knew from his first visit to Darjeeling in 1932. Tenzing and Anglamu used to bargain in the bazaar over the price of milk, which Tenzing used to sell. Tenzing decided to marry Anglamu, and it was possibly the best decision of his life. Because after he married Anglamu, his fortunes changed. He never looked back. Anglamu provided stability to his home and looked after his two daughters as though they were her own. Many say that it was Anglamu who steadied Tenzing's life and guided him to the summit of Everest. So this is a photograph taken possibly in the later years, sometime in the 1950s in Darjeeling, which shows Tenzing, his wife Anglamu, and his two young daughters, Pem Pem and Nima. In 1947, a climber by the name of Earl Denman arrived Darjeeling and wanted to go to Everest. He met Tenzing and he asked Tenzing to take him to Everest. But Denman had no permit and he also had very limited climbing experience. Tenzing knew that the chance of climbing Everest with Denman was next to impossible. He knew it would be a futile expedition, but yet he agreed to take Denman. And as Tenzing says in his autobiography, Man of Everest, for in my heart, I needed to go. And the pull of Everest was stronger for me than any other force 
on earth. So Tenzing is famous and well known for the climb of Everest. He did climb a number of other mountains. In 1947, with a Swiss expedition, he climbed Kedarnath. On this expedition, the Sardar, Wangbi Norbu, met with a very serious accident and had to be carried down the mountain and Tenzing took over as Sardar. This was the beginning of a long relationship with the Swiss. In 1950, he climbed Bandarpunch in an expedition led by Jack Gibson, the headmaster of Dune School. And that was how Bandarpunch came to be known as the Dune School Mountain. Tenzing reached the summit with Kinchok and Roy Greenwood, the two earlier attempts in 1937 and 1946 were unsuccessful. In 1950, Tenzing was the Sardar of a British expedition which went to the Karakoram to attempt Nanga Parbat. However, this was an ill-conceived expedition. The British had left it too late. They were on the slopes of the mountain as late as November when winter set in. The Sherpas refused to go beyond Camp 1, and the expedition lost two climbers, Honli and Grace, on the mountain. Nanga Parbat had earned a reputation as a killer mountain, and 15 Sherpas had died on Nanga Parbat in 1934 and 1937. In 1951, Tenzing climbed Nanda Devi East with the French, and in his autobiography, Tenzing says that Nanda Devi East was a much harder climb than Everest. The action now moves back to Everest and Nepal 1949. Nepal opened its doors for the first time to foreigners in 1949, and this coincided with Tibet closing her borders. The British mountaineer Bill Tillman visited the Everest region in 1950. He was the first Westerner to visit the Solokumbu, and he climbed the famous trekking viewpoint of Kalapattar to see if there was a route to Everest from the south side. Tillman was not very impressed, and he returned home. In the meantime, the British decided to organize a formal expedition called a reconnaissance expedition in 1951 to find a route from Nepal to the summit of Everest. That expedition was led by Eric Shipton. And in this photograph here, taken in the plains of Nepal before starting up the Arun Valley, you can see standing from left to right, Eric Shipton, Bill Murray, Tom Burdillon, Earl Ridiford. And, and sitting in the front is Michael Ward and Ed Hillary. So Eric Shipton and Ed Hillary climbed a spur high above Kalapattar on the slopes of Pumori, reaching approximately around 20,000 feet. And from this high spur, they saw this view of Everest, Lhotse, and Nupse. And Shipton and Hil Hillary realized that there was a route to Everest from south side. And this was the route. Up the icefall, through the western coom, across the Lhotse face, up the Geneva Spur, to the South Col, up the Southeast Ridge, and to the summit of Everest. So Eric Shipton sent a message back from the Solo Kumbu, requesting permission for the British to attempt Everest in 1952. But the British and Shipton were in for a rude shock because the Swiss had booked Everest for the spring of 1952, and they were not willing to form a joint expedition with the British. And Raymond Lambier, seen in this picture, along with Tenzing Norgay, made a very bold attempt from a camp on the Southeast Ridge, 27,250 feet, and managed to reach within 1,000 feet of the summit of Everest before they retreated. It was sad that Lambier and Tenzing fell short on logistical support. They had no sleeping bags in their last camp, they had no stove, and their oxygen cylinders were also not working properly. Had they been fully and properly supported, there was a strong chance that Lambia and Tenzing would have made the summit of Everest 
1952. Knowing that the British had booked the mountain in 1953, the Swiss decided to return to Everest in the autumn of 1952, but it was too cold. The Swiss managed to reach the South Col on 19th November 1952, which was almost into winter, and biting cold and gale force winds forced them back. The Swiss attempt had ended, and it was now the last chance for the British. This photograph shows Tenzing with the Swiss climbers on the Everest expedition 1952. And the Swiss gave Tenzing a memento, a Rolex watch, which is name engraved at the back for his efforts in almost reaching the summit on the 1952 expedition. So Everest 1953, the ninth expedition for the British and the Himalayan committee who managed the Everest expeditions also knew that it was possibly the last chance for the British. So Eric Shipton, an Everest veteran who had possibly the most experience on Everest was initially selected as the leader. But some members of the Himalayan committee felt that Shipton was not the right choice for this do or die expedition. Many of the Himalayan committee knew and Shipton had also professed similar views that he nursed a secret hope that Everest will never be climbed. As Shipton said, I must confess to such feelings myself. Further, Shipton was not a great fan for large siege-like expeditions. He was a fan of small expeditions with a couple of climbers and a few Sherpas in Alpine style. And the expedition to Nanda Devi in 1934, when Shipton and Tillman penetrated the Rishi Gorge and entered the Nanda Devi sanctuary was the best example of an alpine style expedition, which Shipton preferred. Finally, after a lot of backdoor maneuvers, Eric Shipton was eased out of the leadership of the 1953 expedition and John Hunt, a military man, was appointed to lead this expedition. Hunt wanted Tenzing as the Sadar of this expedition but interestingly, Tenzing was not too keen to go up with the British. He had forged a very good relationship with the Swiss and the Swiss had treated him as an equal, as a part of their team. Finally, after a lot of effort, John Hunt was able to appoint Tenzing as a full expedition member, come Sadar, and Tenzing finally agreed to join the British in 1953. This was the first time that a Sherpa was appointed a full expedition member of a British expedition. So this is another historic photograph. Tenzing's mother Kinzom, many years later, comes to Tangboche Monastery and meets Tenzing on the 1953 expedition. So on an acclimatization climb in May 1953, John Hunt and Tenzing climbed a peak in the Imja Valley of the Kumbu called Chukung Peak. And this photograph shows Tenzing on the summit of Chukung Peak, a wonderful view with Amadablam behind. Some of you who have been to the Chukung Valley might have climbed a smaller peak called Chukung Ri, which has a similar view. And John Hunt realized then what a capable mountaineer Tenzing was. And as he says, also at that time, he was fitter than any of us. So this is the route to the summit, 1953. The British had nine camps. Their last camp was camp four. And this is a lot more than the number of camps which you have. If you go to climb Everest today, you would possibly have four or five camps. So a very interesting diagram of the Everest icefall from the ascent of Everest by John Hunt. The icefall was extremely dangerous in 1953, and it is possibly even more dangerous today. Interestingly, I was looking at this diagram and I found that there are two camps which the British had put inside the icefall itself. There was a camp two located here, 
halfway up the ice fall. And then on the exit of the ice fall, there was another camp, camp three. And this is a photograph taken by Alfred Gregory showing Nawang Gombu, Tenzing's nephew, who was then 17 years old, crossing an ice fall ladder. As some of you will know, Nawang Gombu went on to become the first man to climb Everest twice with the Americans in 1963 and with the Indian expedition in 1965. So the final assault on Everest, 1953. The British were having a lot of difficulty in getting to the South Col. And finally, one of the climbers, Wilfred Noyes, along with the Sherpa, Anulu, made the final push across the Geneva Spa and reached the call on 21st May, 1953. Soon after that, 13 Sherpas managed to get to the South Col, carrying 750 pounds of supplies. Six of them made the carry to the South Col twice, a Herculean effort. One of these six was Dawa Thondup, Tenzing's friend from 1932. And it is quite clear that if it had not been for this huge effort by the Sherpas to stock the South Col camp, the British would not have been able to make it to the summit of Everest in 1953. On 26th May, the deputy leader Charles Evans and Tom Bourdillon set off from the South Summit, uh, set off, sorry, from the South Col to reach the South Summit at 1.30 p.m. Burdilan wanted to go ahead. He wanted to have a crack at the summit, but Evans disagreed. There was an argument at the South Summit, and finally, Evans managed to convince his climbing partner to retreat because he felt that even if they had reached the summit of Everest, they would have been benighted on the mountain and their chances of survival would have been very slim. On 28th May, George Lowe, Alf Gregory, and Ang Nima set up camp with Hillary and Tenzing, Camp 9, 27,800 feet, the highest that men had ever slept. And this was the full team who helped Hillary and Tenzing to carry to Camp 9. The leader, uh, John Hunt, Dan Amgyal, Alf Gregory, the youngest Sherpa, Ang Nema, and George Lowe. So Camp 9, 29th May, 6.30 a.m. in the morning. This sketch is taken from Hillary's book, High Adventure, which shows Camp 9 perched on a ledge and Tenzing and Hillary leaving for the summit of Everest. In Man of Everest, Tenzing writes, we looked up and there it is. This time with God's help, we will climb onto the end. Then I look down to the monastery of Tengboche. For me, it is home, the valleys and villages of Solukumbu, where I grew up. And he goes on to say, as we strap on our oxygen tanks, I think back to the boy who had never heard of oxygen, but yet looked up at this mountain and dreamed. Yes, a dream from the Kharta Valley of Tibet to the summit of Everest. So 29th May, 1953, 11.30 a.m., Tenzing and Hillary reached the summit of Everest. It had taken Tenzing seven expeditions and 18 years to stand on the summit of Everest. And it had taken the British 32 years and nine expeditions to put a team on the summit of Everest. And in this iconic photograph taken by Ed Hillary, Tenzing is standing on the summit with all the flags proudly in front of him. And interestingly, Ed Hillary was later asked, why was there no photograph of him on the summit of Everest? And Hillary gave a reply, which has become a classic. He said, as far as I know, Tenzing had never used a camera before. And the summit of Everest was hardly the place to teach him how to use one. <laughs> so 30th May, 1953, the team descends from the South Col. Charles Evans, Ed Hillary, Tenzing, Tom Burdillon, 
and George Band coming down to the Western Coombe. And this photograph, another historic image taken at Camp 4 in the Western Coombe, shows a very tired and exhausted John Hunt with uh, Ed Hillary, Tenzing, Angnima in front, at the back, Alf Gregory, and George Lowe. Kathmandu, 1953, after the successful expedition, the expedition climbers are in these jeeps, and you can see the entire town of Kathmandu has come out to welcome them. There's no place for the jeeps to maneuver their way through the town. So Hillary and Tenzing and John Hunt arrive in London. Uh, the British expedition took Tenzing and his family to London. And Tenzing and Ang Lamu and the girls met the Queen. And Tenzing was given the George Medal by the Queen. And Hunt and Hillary were knighted. Most magazines had Tenzing and Hillary on the cover that year. On the left is Life magazine, July 13th, 1953, with Tenzing and Hillary on their way to the summit of Everest. And the Times Color Supplement also had their photographs on the cover. Soon after the climb of Everest, medal after medal came Tenzing's way. The Indian government gave him the Padma Bhushan, which you can see on the top of this slide. And at the bottom is the George Medal given by Queen Elizabeth. And the list here shows many other medals and honors received by Tenzing from all over the world. In 1954, the government set up the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute in Darjeeling. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the Prime Minister of India, was very keen on outdoor activities. And he told Tenzing, set up a mountaineering institute and create a thousand Tenzings. So the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute was born in Darjeeling and Tenzing became the first field director of the institute and he remained the field director from 1954 right up to 1976, the longest serving field director of the institute. And many climbers who have climbed on high peaks today, including Everest, have been trained in this institute. If you go to Darjeeling today, you will see this rock, which is known as the Tenzing Rock, which is located just below the HMI, where uh, the trainees practice rock climbing. So Tenzing was invited by a lot of foreign governments and dignitaries all over the world to visit them. And this photograph shows him sometimes in the 1950s, climbing with his good friend, Raymond Lambier, in Switzerland. And this photograph taken in the US on the slopes of Mount Rainier shows four Everest summiteers, Jim Whittaker, Tom Horbin, Lou Gestad, all of whom who summited Everest with the American expedition in 1963 and Tenzing himself getting ready to climb the mountain. With Tenzing was his third wife, Taku Tenzing, who was also about to make this climb a very famous photograph taken by another mountaineer, D. Molinar. Tenzing's son, Jamling, says that Tenzing never wanted his children to climb Everest. In fact, Tenzing told Jamling, I climbed Everest so that you wouldn't have to. You can't see the entire world from the top of Everest, Jamling. But Jamling needed to climb Everest. And on 23rd May, 1996, as a part of the IMAX expedition, Jamling summited Everest. And it was not only Jamling, Tenzing's grandson, Kashi Tenzing, summited Everest a year later in 1997. So three generations from Tenzing's family are Everest summiteers. Sadly, Tenzing passed away from a brain hemorrhage in Darjeeling on 9th May, 1986. His funeral procession was one mile long. And Sir Edmund Hillary arrived in Darjeeling to join his funeral procession. And this is what Sir Edmund Hillary had to say. I have never regarded myself as much of a hero, but Tenzing, I believe, undoubtedly was. From humble beginnings, 
he had achieved the summit of the world. Yes, humble beginnings, a yak herder on the slopes of the Kartha Valley, looking up at Everest, and then one day standing on the summit of Everest. In Tenzing's own words, a dream had come true. So this brings me to an end of this presentation. It is a remarkable and inspiring story of a simple man who accomplished his goals despite tremendous odds and following the principle, I will never give in. Thank you very much for this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.